My name is uh, Vivica Chelde, and I'm a senior researcher here at uh, PEACE. And I want to welcome everyone to today's uh, webinar on the US, UK, Australian Security Pact, AUKUS, and on the sort of broader patterns or sort of shifting uh, trends of, of identities and ideas and paradigms in flux beneath it. Um, today's webinar is part of our sort of the kickoff uh, event of um, a longer a series of um, of events and publications that will be focusing on uh, on AUKUS and its implications uh, for Denmark, for Europe, for the world in the coming year. And when we first talked about um, when we first talked about that series and what we wanted to zoom in on, um, we very much agreed that we wanted to make um, we wanted to do something that was a little sort of longer perspective than the here and now. And we did that in the context of uh, an American retreat from Afghanistan um, and a European sense, European fears that, that this was sort of the culmination of a long American pivot to Asia and a, an American farewell to Europe in some ways. So a perspective that saw AUKUS as the replacement in some ways of NATO, or at least as, as the security institution that might long term um, move the US gaze um, permanently from Europe to Asia. And now, just eight months later, um, we're in a very different reality. Uh, we're in the context of um, a war in Ukraine, a Russian war in Ukraine that has certainly pulled the pulled the US back onto the European continent. Um, and all of the questions that sort of ari arise from that. And a sense in many people's minds, I suppose, that they don't even remember that there was such a thing as AUKUS. Um, at least if you live on European soil right now, it seems a thing of the past and like a joke of the past, even like, is this real or was it just a good idea someone had when they had nothing else to do at some point? Um, so I think that just goes to show that in a sense, the acceleration of uh, world events the con constantly sort of accelerated pace of world events these days, the sense that you move from crisis to crisis, makes it very difficult for us as academics to hang on to those ambitions of the long-term perspective. Um, but we still want to hang on to that long-term perspective. Um, so, so the challenge in organizing a series like this is in a sense to find someone who's got the ability to do both, but to find speakers who can do it all, who both have a sense of the day-to-day -day events, but who also have a sense of the historical depth between beneath those events and 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 sort of the longer trajectories of where larger trends in world politics might be hitting. Trends that I think if we get too sucked into discussing what does Ukraine mean to office, for instance, might sort of blind us to something deeper that's at stake. And uh, so we looked around, we thought about who is that genius, who is that master thinker who can help us kick this off. And, um, and, and, and we were really lucky that the first person that we thought of said yes to helping us sort of launch this. Um, so Jen Buczecik, um, whom I'm really grateful want, wanted to be with us today, um, that we are now a little more familiarized with doing webinars made it easier. Um, because Satchin is in um, Canada, so um, so it's a little easier to just do half, one and a half hour seminar with um, with someone you the, like you these days, right? Um, but I think, I mean, when I originally thought about inviting you, Satchin, I um, I actually mainly thought about the work that you've done on British foreign policy, on the Anglosphere, and so on. But giving uh, my introduction of you today some thought. Um, I realized what a brilliant choice we'd made in many ways because because I think there are many ways there are many reasons why from a European perspective it's great to have someone like you um, provide us with the more global take on this. Um, first of all, Surgeon is um, is a, a professor at the uh, University of uh, Ottawa in Canada, and that places you in many ways, close to um, the North American perspective 
uh, closer in some ways or, or embed you in an orbit that views things more from the North American perspective, from the American perspective, which is ultimately also a very large part of this equation, the office equation. But it also places you on this other side of the border, the Canadian side of the border, enabling you probably to see the American perspective a little more from afar than if we just had someone who speaks both from within the American context about this. Um, as someone whom I know has also taken an interest in, I mean, you're both embedded in, in the Canadian context in a middle power or a smaller power perspective on some of this. It's also interesting to hear what you what, what your take on much of this is from for someone like us sitting in the Danish um, context, and I know there are parts of the audience today um, who, who represent other sort of smaller um, European uh, states and their perspectives in all of this. But more broadly, of course, um, your long interest in British foreign policy and British identity, sort of the deeper historical trajectories um, beneath contemporary foreign British foreign policy is what also makes you, I think, an ideal speaker here to set some of this off. Because I've had the question several times from people who thought that I knew anything about AUKUS, which ultimately I don't. But the question, what on earth is the Britain doing in that? Um, pact like what does the US need the UK for? What does Australia need the UK for? Why is it even there? What can it do for them? And in some ways, I think that reveals how little sort of the ordinary audience would think about, like would think about what are the longer historical and cultural trajectories beneath some of this. There would be no Australia, there would be no US, and there would be no idea in, in a sense of a broader Anglo-American world if there wasn't an Anglo-British perspective. So I think it is interesting in some ways to start with someone who probably, I still don't know what you want to say today, of course, but who probably will come to some of this with a particular eye to some of the, the, long, the British visions beneath uh, some, or at least the, the, the component of this that is a British foreign policy that some have been surprised is changing or transforming. Someone like you would probably say, not really if you paid attention to, to longer and deeper um, uh, trajectories within it, but, but I think it, that makes it relevant to start there because that also speaks directly in many ways to the, to the ways in which AUKUS isn't just another security pact, but may somehow, again, this is something I have no idea what you'll say about this, of course, but to the outside observer seems to underline somehow transformations in how um, we think about, and certainly the US thinks about the West from a very Atlantic centered, perhaps to a more global or one that has the Anglo-American component beneath it um, more underscored. Um, so I think that that is another reason why it's you're you're really we're really happy to have you here today. Um, and I should mention that Sadian has written two very um, recommendable books on British foreign policy um, with sort of a ten year interval, one and two eleven on the Anglo sphere um, uh, that came out with Stanford uh, University Press and uh, and just a recent one on uh, from last year. Greatness and Decline, National Identity and British Foreign Policy that came out with McGill's, McGill Queen's University Press. Yeah. But the final reason why I actually think, I mean, looking at your at your sort of your own academic travel to some of, of, of these topics and looking at some of the places where you've been a visiting researcher, because I know that that actually shapes your perspective often, right? Um, that you've not just, I mean, you've spent time in, in Germany, you spent a lot of time in Britain, but you also had um, visiting fellowships um, in India and Singapore, which from the Danish context, this is not something you come across that often in many ways. We are very, very sort of steep in the European and transatlantic perspective. So the minute you start discussing office, it is a good idea to have someone who's slightly in touch with that more Pacific or more global um, part of the world. And I think 
one like final thing that um that is interesting here is i mean your own personal first-hand experience with the um with the dissolution or or the um, disintegration of yugoslavia probably in many ways feel that it's not that it's not that foreign to imagine that what you thought was permanent and the structures you thought were in place forever um, may just up and disrupt and disappear one day. And when I talk to people from the academic world, from the policy environments um, in the Western European context, they do find it difficult to imagine that anything like the status quo of the current NATO situation, the current sort of security structure will ever go. We might use slightly different means. We might tip the scales slightly, but nothing real is gonna happen. Don't worry. Um, so without knowing for sure whether AUKUS will be a game changer at all, I just think that that keeping one's mind open to the notion that something dramatic might happen um, and that these sorts of transformations matter you should be aware from the beginning of where they might take things is, is a good idea that's it for me i think um just to talk the audience through what will happen uh from here i will um now give certain the floor and you um will probably present uh the title of your talk yourself Sajan, but in um in framing it, uh, something new, something old, something borrowed, as you did in our initial emails, I understand that you view AUKUS as a sort of new marriage in um, international relations. So we're looking forward to hearing if it's love, duty, or necessity. Um, how forced is this marriage? Um, and uh, you have as much time as you want, basically. Um, after which, I will hand the floor over to my colleague here at this, uh, Stefano Puccini, who is, um, as uh, most of you in the audience probably know, um, very, very well versed in, um, in both European, American, and larger sort of global geopolitics, and will certainly also help us with that sort of broader perspective and not being too sucked into everyday uh, events. And then there'll be, um, and this is important, for the audience to take note of, then there'll be time for Q&A. That will take place through the Q&A function. So please write your questions there as, um, as they pop up, uh, because then I'll try and, um, yeah, I'll try and sort of translate, moderate that, and if necessary, boil it into a manageable amount of uh, questions towards the end. That's it for me. The floor is yours, uh, Stefan. Well, thank you so much. Can you hear me, everyone? Uh, I'm enormously happy to be here. I visited these in the pre-pandemic time. Had a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful day there. Uh, very grateful to you, Vibeke, for inviting me. Uh, this is a huge pleasure. Uh, and also to Stefano for agreeing to act as discussant, uh, not least because uh, I've been learning from Stefano since I was a graduate student, and I've been teaching Stefano's work uh, ever since as well. So I have some slides uh, prepared, I think 30 minute, 35 minute talk uh, using some slides. If that's okay, I'll put them up just now. So here we are, I used your image. Thank you for that as well. Uh, the title, it is, a bad metaphor uh, to, uh, for for, uh, for alliances, for marriages of convenience, if you like. But also, I, I liked it as a way of breaking the talk in three uh, parts, something new, something old, and something borrowed, with a question mark, of course. Uh, something new is perhaps the easiest one, the quickest one. Uh, why something new? Well, because it, ca it came uh, unexpectedly uh, on September 15, uh, 2021. Uh, Biden, Morrison, Johnson had a video conference in which they announced uh, 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 what what media would later describe as a seismic tectonic uh, event, an earthquake, using all sorts of geo uh, ge geo uh, geological metaphors to talk about uh, geopolitics. A friend of mine uh, in Australia, a colleague, uh, described it as the best uh, secret in Australian history. Uh, this is also uh, correct. 
very few people, I think, knew about this, uh, and, and those who did immediately wrote uh, op-eds and such uh, in, in a variety of English and French language newspapers. What's interesting about the joint statement is that uh, it leaves uh, a lot of space to be filled. China, for example, is not mentioned. Uh, there's talk of the challenges of the 20th century. There's talk of wide ranging goals uh, for, for the new alliance, promote, promoting deeper uh, information and technology sharing, integrating security and defense, uh, related science, technology, industrial bases and supply chains, and enhancing the three nations joint capability and interoperability. Now, the big story uh, uh, of that day was the unilateral cancellation of the 90 billion uh, Franco-Australian submarine deal for uh, 12 conventional Barracuda submarines for eight nuclear powered ones to be built in the future uh, with US uh, and UK technology. And when I say the future, we're talking about 20 years from now. Now, this was extremely upsetting uh, to France. Uh, Jean-Yves Ladrion was very upset the, the, that day on Radio France. He, he called it un coup dans le dos, which sounds perhaps even better in the original German, you know, dos, dos. Uh, the French state felt very, very humiliated. Um, uh, Emmanuel Macron uh, demonstrated this 48 hours later by withdrawing uh, France's ambassadors from Washington and Canberra. Of course, as I said, this was uh, media gold. Uh, these sorts of dramatic events don't happen very often. And, and there was a lot of reporting on this. Several other governments were upset. Uh, the communist one in, in, in Beijing, obviously, uh, the smaller communist one in Pyongyang as well. Uh, but the democratically elected ones in Jakarta, Kuala Lumpur, and even Wellington, uh, although, although not, not very clearly, New Zealand uh, voiced some concerns more or less legitimate uh, about the pact's effects on arms, uh, regional arms race but also they argued on nuclear proliferation. Uh, some harsh criticisms of the pact came from uh, two former uh, prime ministers of Australia. Uh, and to uh, make things really terrible, uh, the AUKUS announcement overshadowed the launch of the European Union's uh, strategy for cooperation in the Indo-Pacific, uh, which was launched the next day. And it was done, this was done by the European Commission, Ursula von Leiden, uh, the president uh, was supposed to present it to the European Parliament, she did, but this was kind of overshadowed shadowed by the uh, by the news of AUKUS. Some argued that the UK government did this on purpose. Not sure about uh, that, also not sure about uh, Canberra's decision to go with it. It was not a, a great move uh, to alienate a, a powerful European country while in negotiations for a free trade agreement uh, with the EU. So there was no shortage of drama. Uh, I mean, I do see it, I mean, in, in light of Ukraine, of course, everything, it has a new perspective. When the media described it as an earthquake, well, maybe 4.6 or something on the Richter magnitude scale, uh, when the windows are broken, furniture moves, and so on. Uh, but but nothing nothing exactly what we're going through right now in this uh, a geopolitical and political moment. Uh, and there there are going to be consequences which I wish uh, to discuss with you today. So what is uh, what is old about this pact? We know what what's new, uh, but what is old? So to to start this conversation. I wanted to go with one of the critics of the PAC coming from Australia, Paul Keating, former pro, uh, prime minister, who, who said, Australia turns its back on the 21st century, uh, the century of Asia, for the jaded and faded Anglosphere, the domain of the Atlantic, a world away. Now, this is very interesting. Uh, Morrison described uh, AUKUS as forever partnership, implying that it's been around forever, it will be forever, I mean, sort of. There's a choices ambiguity there. And a lot of people agreed with him, uh, essentially both of Australia's uh, political parties. And the, the mainstream opinion embraced it. Opposition to AUKUS is still a minority view. And Paul Keating uh, was perhaps the, the loudest voice. There's also been criticism from uh, Kevin Rudd, uh, also another um, former prime minister, same party. Uh, the end that was published in Le Monde Diplomatique, uh, uh, it focused on different things, but, but this is essentially uh, the central point, yeah, the jaded and faded Anglosphere. Now, this is uh, more about security in, as conventionally understood. Uh, the Keating government, which lasted until 1996, uh, was the last one that tried to balance 
the Anglosphere, so-called Anglosphere, uh, with uh, Australia's uh, Asia's interests, if you like. Uh, most subsequent governments were very Anglosphere-oriented. Howard, Abbott, Turnbull, Morrison. Uh, these were all liberal-led coalition governments. As for Labour, uh, the second uh, Kevin Rudd government, uh, as well as the Julia Gillard government, were kind of similar. Gillard, for example, invited U.S. troops to Darwin, uh, regularly ro rotating through Darwin, uh, which was a signal that the Anglosphere vote was more important than perhaps uh, the neighborhood. Um, uh, the first Rudd government tried to push into Asia, so-called push into Asia, with its uh, Asia-Pacific Community Plan, but that was uh, short-lived. So. This makes uh, Keating's point very interesting. Uh, it, it brings domestic uh, politics to the fore, and not just any kind of domestic politics, but domestic identity politics, if you like. Uh, his hypothesis is that Canberra suffers from some sort of colonial era delusions uh, and uh, uh, illusions of security. Since the 18th century, uh, uh, Australia has always looked to the metropole, to London for its protection. And then with the shocking fall of Singapore in 1942, uh, the, the source of protection was the United States. It aspired for more security furnished by uh, these two uh, great and powerful friends, as, as one uh, former uh, Prime Minister uh, Menzies uh, described them. Uh, and World War II was in, in fact the crucible in which uh, the special relationship between these two great and powerful uh, friends uh, was formed. And you can say that this special relationship constitutes the core of the so-called Anglo Anglosphere. And now that's what I want to talk about today. Uh, and as Vivica was very kind uh, in her introduction, it has been uh, my, my research topic for a very long time. And I've always struggled to conceptualize it. And, and, and I don't think I'm the only one, but it is, it is, a, it, it is a very uh, mercurial uh, conceit, um, let alone concept. Uh, so, so I have something that's work in progress. Uh, it's basically uh, a diagram uh, with non-concentric uh, circles uh, that I, I use to explain uh, things such as AUKUS, not just AUKUS, but other uh, institutions, uh, practices, uh, habits, if you like, uh, that seem to have a certain kind of grip on foreign policies of countries like Australia, but not just Australia, UK. Uh, Canada, New Zealand, and the U.S. Um, it's I conceptualize the Anglosphere as uh, as uh, in, in this diagram to show you that we can think of it in terms of uh, a continuum going from signals intelligence cooperation, so the five eyes, through transgovernmental networks, uh, through a security community. It's a concept that comes from IR to a transnational space through a geopolitical field or or world. Uh, the outer circle uh, would be the province of something called international political economy, intellectual history, or even uh, political geography. So for political geographers, they haven't really written on this, uh, but if, I imagine if they did, they would say that uh, it is, um, the Anglosphere is some sort of a post-imperial geographic landscape uh, filled with elements of economic, social, cultural uh, interdependence and integration uh, with a perhaps a stack of interlocking um, uh, ideologies, ideas, discourses, practices, habits. Being an IR person who does security mostly, I'll focus on the first three circles, arguing that AUKUS represents a manifestation, I mean, the latest manifestation of the Anglosphere as a security community. So we'll see how that works. I've, I've not published this slide, uh, by the way, or this figure uh, for good reasons. And uh, below the line, which is supposed to uh, signal some sort of transversality here. I have names of authors associated with the, each of these tradition, traditions of research. Uh, I won't get into that now, uh, and I hope you'll forgive me for that. So to illustrate uh, what's going on in these non-centric circles, I need some kind of point of historification, a little, a little bit of history, if you like. And I propose one date. It's March 5th, 1946. Why that? Well, two important things happened in this day. The first was, uh, the signing of the so-called AUKUS uh, memorandum or AUKUS agreement, which was uh, a treaty regulating an open exchange of intelligence on the communications of uh, foreign nations. Uh, AUKSA was expanded with Canada joined in 1948, followed by Australia and New Zealand in 1956. And then we got something called the Five Eyes, uh, uh, which uh, during the Cold War, 
allow the national uh, intelligence agencies to share monitoring infrastructure to track nuclear armed Soviet subs, for example. And the surveillance partnership simply expanded exponentially following the 9-11 attacks in the United States when the monitoring of the internet uh, communications became sort of enormously enormously consequential politically. And we learned about this, we say we, those who did not pay attention to the Anglosphere, if you like, uh, in 2003 with the so-called Snowden uh, disclosures. By the way, AUKUS is sometimes known as the three eyes, uh, as opposed to the five eyes, because it, it's, it's meant to signal a certain kind of continuity with that first uh, uh, circle that I showed earlier. So. Uh, what is the five eyes? Well, yes, it's about signals intelligence, uh, but it's not just about signals intelligence. Uh, the five eyes meetings no longer include uh, just that. They include 22 different agencies and ministries of home inter or slash internal affairs and public safety uh, ministers and so on. So we have these so-called five country ministerials uh, uh, that meet every year. Uh, and then they bring directors of all these agencies together, usually uh, uh, in uh, in some kind of task forces where all sorts of things are discussed, from uh, cyber uh, to China to uh, to whistleblowing, indeed. Um, and this this matrix is something I, I I'm working on right now. Uh, hopefully, there'll be a book in the future called Understanding uh, the Five Eyes, which I'll be co-authoring with. Uh, Haga Ben Jafel uh, from CNRS uh, Paris. Uh, beyond going beyond intelligence, we have the so called Anglosphere Transgovernmental Policy Network. Uh, and this is uh, a research agenda associated with my colleague Tim McGran uh, uh, from Australia, who's been for many years tracing uh, these. Uh, a very informal gatherings of people from a variety of ministries and government agencies in the five countries, and sometimes six countries because Ireland is included, but other times four countries because one of the five ice countries is not included. And they deal with everything from immigration to crime to passports to food security. And he argues that there's about 40 of them. Uh, and they also vary in terms of uh, engagement. Uh, from cabinet secretaries who uh, exchange information to actually amalgamation of uh, entire government uh, functions. So he has this uh, continuum of low engagement to high engagement. And again, this is just a signal that there's a literature out there on transgovernmental networks uh, that somehow speak for uh, the Anglosphere uh, and it's uh, Tim Legrand's work. Um, if this looks like the EU in some context, then it's because it is, and that actually has uh, very interesting ramifications for politics, especially on the conservative side of politics. There are a lot of people who've been looking at stuff like this for a very long time and saying, well, it looks like we have already all sorts of uh, cooperation in security writ large, but really writ large. Uh, why don't we think about different other types of integration, not just economic, but also political and geopolitical. And that's something that I could talk about uh, in the Q and A as well. Now, I want for now. I just want to go back to my date, chosen date for uh, the history of the Anglosphere, March fifth, nineteen forty six, and this is the Iron Curtain speech uh, given uh, by uh, Sir Winston Churchill uh, in Fulton, Missouri. Now we all remember it as the Iron Curtain speech, but of course that's not was that was not even the main punchline that Churchill had envisaged uh, when he uh, gave it. Uh, the crux of the speech, as he uh, as he uh, called it uh, in the speech itself, uh, were two things: uh, the special relationship between uh, the British Empire and Commonwealth and the United States, and a fraternal association of the English-speaking people. A phrase that he used uh, at, at the time as well. Now, so what did he mean by that? Well, uh, you will perhaps recognize the argument even today. Uh, there's tyranny in the world. Uh, the United Nations is the United Nations organization at the time is, is too weak and too inefficient to deal with it. But luckily, we have this thing called the English speaking people who are very efficient uh, in uh, fighting tyrants. So perhaps uh, they should think about cooperating, cooperating more closely. And that, some argue, would be a good summary of this thing we call uh, the liberal international order. Uh, and it's Anglo-American security axis that's about 75 plus years old now. Uh, 
Now, what exactly did he mean by fraternal association? We, we have generally a good idea of a special relationship because it's entered even international relations uh, lexicon. There are books written on special relationship as a concept, and practice in IR, but fraternal association is perhaps something new. So he has this long 50 word sentence in the speech where he talks about uh, friendship and mutual understanding between our two vast uh, kindred systems of society. And then he goes, continuance of intimate relationship between our military advisors leading to common study of potential dangers, similarity of weapons and manuals instructions and to the in interchange of officers. So this is very interesting. At the time of the speech, uh, there was such thing as the combined chiefs of staff, the supreme military command for the Anglo-American forces established in the 1941 Arcadia Conference. Uh, it was operational and would remain in force right through the Berlin uh, blockade of 1948. Uh, today, we don't have this thing, uh, but we do have the White House uh, discussing, for example, Taiwan conflict uh, contingency planning with the UK government. Uh, and this is just from last week. Uh, within several years, uh, people in Australia expect that Australia will join them in holding these high level uh, talks on deterrence and uh, rising concerns about China. That's perhaps one of the main purposes uh, behind AUKUS, uh, putting aside the technology transfer and arms deal elements of it. Now, when Churchill was speaking uh, in 1945, likewise operationalists were efforts to improve uh, standardization uh, for the so-called uh, AB, AB, ABC armies, American, British, and Canadian armies. Uh, this thing uh, is what we would today call interoperability. So this standardization plan from 1946 today evolved into something called ABCANS. ABCANS is American, British, Canadian, Australian, New Zealand armies program. And I took this from their Twitter account. Uh, and the purpose is uh, to promote engagement, inform modernization and maximize interoper interoperability in the land domain. And now when the word interoperability is used, which is maybe 20 years old, it's not just any interoperability, it's seamless or advanced interoperability. And guess what? It's not even just the land domain. It's in every domain. Uh, you have it from space to uh, combined communications, electronics, to technical cooperation on various matters. You have uh, uh, naval officers meetings. You have special forces communications. Uh, device was produced by NSA for all Five Eyes armies or for all Afghan's armies. Uh, there's military coalition warfare. I've written on this uh, quite a bit myself. Uh, and then there's nuclear proliferation, which is something that Churchill himself uh, mentioned in the speech. So at the time of the speech, this was uh, March, uh, that cooperation looked very promising. In August that year, that would change through events in congressional politics in the United States, but it was quickly reestablished. Uh, and this is, this is what gets me to my, uh, I guess, third part of the talk, which is the, under the rubric something borrowed. So what exactly was something borrowed? When, when I heard of AUKUS, I was just listening to radio that day, I thought, oh, wow, this reminds me of uh, something that I was writing about long ago, uh, which is the Skybolt Affair, the name of a crisis in the UK-US relations caused by American decision to cancel a missile program that the British military intended to use at, as its main uh, nuclear delivery system. This is from the 60s. Uh, the TIFF was entirely deep and public uh, with Atchison, Dean Atchison, State Secretary, making things worse. And you know this uh, uh, with his famous jibe uh, about Britain losing an empire, never finding a role. Uh, well, that same month, uh, 1962, the Macmillan met with President John F. Kennedy NASA, where they struck a huge deal. Uh, which was much in the spirit of the special relationship, a special nuclear relationship between the two countries. The transfer to Britain of superior US-made nuclear missile system, Polaris. So much like the Trident uh, later on, this deal was an exclusive only to the UK. And we see something very similar to AUKUS today. The crown jewel of US nuclear technology is being transferred to Australia or promised to be transferred to Australia because we don't know exactly if this is going to happen all sorts of technology tra uh, transfer deals are uncertain uh, and there are good reasons for that, both political and, and technological. So much like AUKUS, uh, the NASA deal had adverse consequences for the Anglosphere's relationship with Europe, you could argue, uh, in the sense that it confirmed 
The French President Charles de Gaulle believed that Britain was America's Trojan horse, uh, which in turn compelled him to veto Britain's application for uh, EEC membership in January 1963 and again December 1967. Uh, but the, for, for the French, uh, you could argue elites and masses alike, uh, this resonated really well. Uh, and you know we can talk about the details, uh, but one of my colleagues, a historian, uh, Emile Chaval, uh, once did a study of the use of the noun and adjective Anglo-Saxon, uh, Anglo-Saxon or Anglo-Saxon in French, uh, over time, uh, and you know he discovered that it's been going up and up over time. Uh, the talk, uh, they, the French use the word uh, to talk about the Anglosphere itself, but also. Uh, to talk about themselves as in their own alter ego uh, all the all those things negative about economy and even politics are described as anglo-saxon uh president sarkozy was once called our anglo-saxon president and that's not a compliment so the, the word is used uh in, in a variety of ways uh, in languages other than english that tells us something about the constitution of this thing we call the anglosphere uh, and I think uh, I think that's actually that goes at the core of what a lot of people in international relations theory call outside recognition, which is uh, a whole other kind of uh, topic to for, for discussion. But I will just flag uh, something from history as well, something that uh, Henry Kissinger said at Chatham House in 1982, and this is uh, a quote that's been I guess reproduced in a lot of work, including my work, because I think it really. Uh, captures uh, this, this idea of uh, the inside-outside dynamics uh, that are important for understanding AUKUS, but not just AUKUS. The ease and informality, informality of Anglo-American partnership has been the source of wonder, and no little resentment to third parties. Our post-war diplomatic history is littered with uh, arrangements, understanding, sometimes some crucial issues, never put into formal documents. And this, I think, really captures the, the earlier point about the, the informality and the ease by which all these transgovernmental uh, networks are coming and going, but mostly coming and staying uh, uh, among, uh, between and among the five countries uh, constituting uh, the Anglosphere. Now, what's with the outside recognition today? Well, as you can imagine, uh, you know, if we if we step back from the Anglo-French relationship and its importance and the constitution of this thing we call the West, well, there are other players as well. Uh, for China. China would be making an argument today that yeah, this is the Five Eyes is strengthening its uh, its its power in uh, in 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 Asia, and it's essentially axis of white supremacy. This is the Global Times editorial uh, that caused uh, all kinds of uh, reaction on both, uh, especially on the right, but also uh, on the left in all five uh, Ang the Anglosphere countries or Five Eyes countries when it was published in two thousand and and twenty one. Uh, and it really goes to, uh, in my view, uh, goes to uh, the nature of the hege of hegemonic contestations in world politics today. And they're not simply geopolitical, as in a rising China versus a declining Anglosphere or declining West. No, they're also about trying to flame the uh, culture wars that, that happen uh, uh, for various other reasons within and across and between uh, Western nations. Uh, and I tried to trace some of the effects such editorials have, but in Chinese state discourse, uh, Communist Party of China discourse, but also state discourse more generally, there's such a thing as Anglo-Saxon clique uh, taking over the world. And this is how AUKUS is uh, regarded today as well. So how did this thing called the Anglosphere happen? Uh, well. There was nothing inevitable about this. I mean, I dated somewhat earlier than World War II. Uh, I know this is controversial, but actually my, my explanation of the rise of the Anglosphere starts in the Victorian times. And I won't get into it right now for, for, because there's no time for it, but, but I, I will just say that I'm happy to talk about it in the Q&A. Uh, but, you know, we can go back to March 1946 and the Fulton speech. Uh, so when Churchill gave his theory of world politics and theory of history, talking about a special relationship, talking about the fraternal association of the English speaking people. Uh, he upset many. I mean, he upset uh, people uh, on the left, meaning liberals and socialists, not to mention communists. Uh, the conservatives liked what he had to say because he was one of the first to say, let's not appease Stalin. Uh, Acheson and Truman were particularly upset about the term, the special relationship. They did not like it. 
was kind of clashing with US foreign policy goals, which was one of which was decolonization. They didn't want to have anything to do with the British Empire. But then, of course, events happened. Uh, Soviet expansion in Europe, the Truman Doctrine, the Marshall Plan, you mentioned earlier the Berlin blockade, the communist victory in China. All of those things uh, happened, vindicating Churchill's argument, not just about the Iron Curtain, but also about the special relationship. Uh, and so uh, perhaps if you don't like this uh, cartoon, you can go back to Frost, uh, Foreign Relations to the United States archives. And there's a US State Department memo from April 1950 that says, to achieve our foreign policy objectives, we must have the cooperation of our allies and friends, the British, and with them, the rest of the Commonwealth, particularly the older dominions, are our most reliable allies with whom a special rela relationship uh, should exist. Uh, there's a kind of a left-wing perspective on this, which would say, uh, which would say something that this, whenever we want to support any place, we find the British on an island within an easy reach. This is of CIA's Frank uh, Wisner. Uh, talking to uh, the great controversial Kim Philby in 1952. It could be a, a, apocryphal, obviously, uh, but it is. it has this uh, James Bond styled spy thrill, thriller fiction feel to it. Um, and, uh, you know, we could ex explain tr or try to explain the rest uh, with a simple concept of path dependence. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll end with this uh, slide in which I uh, borrow from a very rare statement uh, by directors of GCHQ and NSA, in this case, Jeremy Fleming and General Paul Nakasone from last year, published on March 5th, 2021. They say our alliance began before World War II, and when it was formalized in 1946, it built on shared uh, history of strong shared values, including respect for privacy and the rule of law. It grew stronger with the older dominions. They joined in the years that followed, and together we're greater than the sum of our parts. This is almost Churchill, Churchillian uh, language circa uh, 1946. And I'm illustrating this point uh, to say, to make a conceptual kind of argument, which is that uh, one way to explain it would be just, you know, with the concept of path dependence, events that happened early on uh, had big influence later uh, as governments went along, the range of future possibilities grew, gets narrower. And it becomes more and more unlikely that you can simply shift from one path to another, uh, even if you're locked in on a path that has lower payoff uh, than an alternative one. So when a foreign or defense policy entails a major setup cost and large numbers of people who must devote time and resources to developing expertise, the early choices become difficult to reverse. Uh, economists call, call this increasing returns where the benefits of policy increase more as people organize their activities around it. Uh, and these early decisions become self-enforcing. So that would be one explanation of how, in the end, we had this jaded and faded angle here for 75 plus years. There could be another angle to it, which was perhaps uh, an IR, a constructivist IR uh, uh, concept. Uh, it's ontological security, which is confidence in knowing who you are when you're going on in the world. Uh, one reason uh, why so many Australians elites and masses alike, or mass publics alike, uh, were happy about AUKUS was, in fact, uh, its resonance, I would argue, with the dominant discourses of Australian and national identity discourses that also go back to uh, early 20th and late 19th century. And so, uh, yes, to conclude very briefly, uh, the risks were caused. Uh, in September, on September 15th, but they subsequently healed. The, many of us expected them to heal by uh, the time of President Biden's first summit uh, for democracy in December 2021. But of course, with Ukraine, it's really a sideshow for now. This, will, this has a, a sort of cyclical logic, of course, this AUKUS will come back. Uh, in, in, in terms of gaining headlines uh, in, later this year and, and, and in, future, in subsequent years. I, too, uh, like Keating, agree that, yes, it's about primarily about the Anglosphere, joining the Anglosphere group, which is collective identity that exists above uh, the level of nations and regions, if, if you like. But I'm not sure that it's jaded and faded just yet. That doesn't mean that I agree with uh, Global Times, China's angriest tabloid, uh, but it it is it it makes us think that even if something like AUKUS 
fails through, there are other institutions, practices, habits out there that constitute the Anglosphere insecurity alone that will keep uh, keep the current reality going. Uh, I will stop there and apologize if I went over my allotted time and I will stop sharing my uh, slides. Thank you, Sergeant. Um, I'll simply hand over directly to you, uh, Stefano. Um, and you can decide, I don't know what you want to do, a larger chunk of comments or a back and forth with uh, Sergeant. You work that uh, out amongst yourselves um, before I then jump in again. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks, Sirjan, for uh, for the presentation, for walking us through, in fact, as usual, quite remarkable um, issues like the enormous number of formal and informal agreements which provide a network in which we very often don't think so much about. I mean, the diplomatic sphere is very often an oral sphere. It's an often an informal sphere. and. Uh, well, as scholars, we usually cannot so easily get uh, to this. So it is, um, it's a remarkable um, walk uh, for us through this. I, I would propose that I ask questions about different components and uh, you come back and I come back with a, with a new one. Um, they are to, part, to some extent connected to what, we, what this special relationship is all about. Uh, to some extent to what um, what you said at the very end to explain why Australia made this um, happen in the most secret way uh, perhaps as well and then something about the relationship to China and finally about the security architecture that this um, relates to and some of the potential or not so potential comparisons to um, well um, things that happened in in Europe in particular perhaps beforehand so let me start with a special relationship and uh, one date which um, besides Nassau or what happened before Nassau also provided uh, some rather deep soul, soul searching in uh, the special relationship, which is the Suez crisis. Um, so in the 56 moment was not an easy moment for Britain uh, in the sense that it was um, called back and yeah, trimmed to what its size really was. And the, um, I'm not quite sure, and you will, that's the question I want to go there, to what extent this has left marks in the way that Britain conceives itself, i.e. that the special relationship that Churchill thought about was a way of, of uh, punching above perhaps its power, but Sue has reminded everyone where the power lied. Uh, and the, um, therefore, the, there is a path dependency, sure, for a very long time and might have existed well before the Second World War, but it seems to me that maybe there has been something in the internal arrangement in which Britain is not the equal partner um, that is proposing um, just as if its old empire would, um, would go on, but it's the junior partner uh, at best, despite all the symbolic attempts here and there that the US might have in order to keep the UK on a, on a, thing, um, on a par. So the first question is about what do you think is the actual relationship inside, but also in terms of the identity discourses that you have been also looking at, what effect Suez might or might not have on the long run on these attempts to, um, to link up with the US or to link up with the Commonwealth? Can you hear me now? Apologize. All right. Uh, yeah, no, Suez is, is probably, Brent Fleitberg, uh, Swedish political scientist, uh, has this uh, uh, concept of paradigmatic cases uh, in his case study theory. And I would, I would always call the Suez crisis a paradigmatic case for studying alliances, alliance unity, unity alliance management. Uh, and it was a shock. I mean, earlier I talked about the use of uh, geological metaphors to talk about geopolitics. Well, the, all of those metaphors was used in, were used in 1956. Uh, and it was uh, remarkable for a variety of ways, one of which was uh, UK decision, uh, meaning successive UK governments have decided to hug the Americans close uh, after Suez, right? Now, comparisons with France, a fellow European major power likewise bursting with kind of losing an empire and 
trying having trouble finding a role. Uh, they they show us exactly what ha the, the grip, the anglospheric grip on on U.S. Or UK foreign policy after Suez. Um, for France, Suez meant we have to do something very different. And many would say, well, that that different thing is the European Union, all the way to Macron's speech from this week on the importance of building the European political community and so on. Um, uh, but you can definitely see that, but historically, phrases such as Western unity or Cold War neutrality meant very different things in London and Paris, certainly after Suez. A decade after 1956, uh, De Gaulle uh, would move to denounce uh, Bretton Woods and call for a return to gold uh, and then detach forces from NATO integrated command. Uh, well, why was this never an option in London? Uh, well, simply put, British and French decision makers make made different decisions when faced with similar structural pressures, whether in relation to debt, decolonization, or the US phase, uh, US Soviet conflict, right? Uh, my, I mean, I never studied France uh, in, in great detail. I mean, there are good books uh, that, 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 that speak to that case uh, on, which, on which I base what I'm gonna say now. But I would say that uh, there was never, uh, there was never an identification with the United States uh, in France that we see uh, in, in the UK. And when I say identification, I, I mean not in some essential sense, but I, I'm referring to discourses of national identity or predominant discourses of national identity. I traced this empirically. I studied you know, how the British society defined itself uh, before and after Suez to try to understand uh, any big shifts and differences. And it was remarkable to me to see that it wasn't simply elites uh, who kept repeating the mantra that, yes, we have to, our role is to act as auxiliaries to US power, or US hegemony. But it was, in fact, the masses as well. Uh, over time, they became more supportive of this idea of the special relationship. It was never expressed as the special relationship or the Anglosphere, but it was it expressed in ways uh, that, that capture um, this practical, uh, habitual, and effective commitment uh, to to this specific uh, foreign policy, uh, and it is it is very puzzling. Uh, and one explanation would be historical, which is to say, well, what are exactly what's the content of these claimed common values or common uh, traits that bind. Uh, US and UK together or the Anglosphere together. Well, I mean, if you go back to the uh, Victorian and Edwardian times, like Churchill did in his speeches and his books, then you know you, you 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 simply cannot help it but look at the ways in which language, culture more broadly, and at that time it was defined as synonymous with race, played in creating these initial conditions which made possible for the UK governments, again, successive UK governments, to pursue what historian David Reynolds calls power by proxy. Now, constructivist in IR these days would, would call that you know, vicarious identification. Uh, you know, UK would live its greatness through America. Uh, and in France, it's that's simply just, it, it's the opposite. All right. Yes, I, indeed, I wanted um, to think about the, the US as the better UK self. So the, you came up with, the, with this idea. But coming back to this idea of ontological security, and then the Australians uh, with the difficulty of defining themselves as being yeah, both um, part of the Anglosphere of a certain past and tradition, and yet finding themselves in Asia and having to find a way of somewhat combining the two and having as you rightly said with Keating, but also the um, series of prime ministers, uh, an attempt to both integrate themselves into the Asian environment, yet keeping the specificity that it has, um, huge landmass, but not that many people, uh, and um, therefore relatively exposed uh, as well, if one thinks about it in security terms. Now, ontological security um, has this idea that um, countries seek um, an environment in which they find their own identity at ease, uh, in which, uh, and so it is um, not that much, it is about keeping a certain stability of that identity. Now, the, the question I would like to ask is that some countries are notoriously unable to reach ever that kind of 
balance. Um, and there are different ways to think about it. One is, um, and that is the theoretically perhaps not necessarily best, the homeostatic vision of ontological security. There will be a balance and everything is always going to a balance, but sometimes countries actually, and um, well, can I, how can I say, um, they enroll in this anxiety, they enroll in the hybridity that comes with it uh, and finding there maybe not the kind of balance, but um, not feeling out of sync with that. So the question I have is, I mean, Russia has been often um, analyzed or Turkey has been analyzed as being unable to find a way to, to, to find itself at ease in the environment in which it is. And you cannot define the definition. It pen, the pendulum will always go back and forth. Do you see um, in AUKUS an attempt no longer to have the pendulum, no longer to, or do you think that it will just as any attempt before either way feel, in unsatisfactory um, because there is ASEAN, there is China, there is a sense in which Australia will be part not just of the Anglosphere but of a of an Asian security uh, architecture um, that it that it will be unstable and that despite the attempt to stabilize it, it won't make it. Yeah, this is a great question. Uh, it's one of those future oriented ones as well. Uh, and uh, a colleague of mine, a co-author, in fact. Brendan O'Connor from the University of Sydney, uh, his reaction to AUKUS was, oh, when this, when I heard the news, he didn't know it was coming like everybody else. He thought of Samuel Huntington, the great controversial Samuel Huntington, who in his Clash of Civilization thesis calls Australia a liminal country, the liminal status being situated uh, in between the predominantly white West uh, on, on the one hand and the predominantly non-white Asia Pacific on, on the other. And this was, uh, an acute point for him to think about uh, various civilizational faults and so on. Uh, and and O'Connor's in op-ed, he reacted with it in an op-ed, I forgot where it was published, uh, was, well, if only, if only Australia was actually feeling the liminality. Uh, Huntington was completely wrong. It seems to me, he argued, uh, that, you know, throughout our history, we've always chosen to be closer to our great and powerful friends. Uh, the twin imperial metropole of London and Washington, as opposed to try and renegotiate some sort of a, a more regional identity. Uh, uh, New Zealand is a very good comparison. New Zealand under this government, uh, just in this uh, uh, other government, sees itself as uh, as belonging to South Pacific region. I mean, you, you won't hear Australia saying anything like that in recent years. Um, so. I would say that the majority opinion, I mean, this would require a certain kind of research design where usually these research designs are based on qualitative content analysis or discourse analysis of what elites are saying or governments are saying, elites more broadly or masses are saying. And, uh, and what we would find is probably that the Anglosphere makes more sense or as one uh, Australian uh, uh, brigadier uh, back when I was doing uh, a PhD on this, uh, put it, uh, it feels good. And he wasn't talking about AUKUS, uh, he was talking about ANZUS, but, but the idea is the same, that this feels good. Uh, and it probably still feels good for the majority. Now, could we get to a point where there is some kind of a crisis and this crisis becomes productive uh, of certain next stage of identity formation? I think that's possible. Uh, so when I, last time I read, here, Lundstad's work on US foreign policy, uh, empire by invitation and all that. Uh, so he would say, well, actually, yes, transatlantic uh, ties are strong because of these common or shared values you know, or overlapping or collective identities in constructivist language. But I see this thing called demographic change. US is changing demographically, meaning you know it's no longer so easily definable as a white settler colony that turned into whatever global hegemon. Um, US will change domestically, and then that, that will have huge implications for its policies, including foreign policy. Again, very Huntingtonian argument as well. Uh, and uh, and yeah, would this happen to Australia? Well, this is a big question, right? Uh, we, we've had cases of demographic, uh, demographic change uh, in all sorts of, sorts of countries. Historically, uh, the question is what what this means in political terms. I mean, who who or what retains power? What kinds of narratives uh, predominate to uh, to to uh, define who we are? 
and I think this is where we enter uh, the so-called culture wars that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and in these culture wars, we have hegemonic contestations that are happening every day on almost every level. Um, and you know, claiming that something is a predominantly white alliance pact is itself a hugely explosive statement politically. I mean, that that kind of brings in uh, all sorts of uh, debates and, and vigorous disagreements. Uh, and that too is very constitutive of a certain kind of identity formation, which currently is open. Uh, it can go either way. You know, we might end up defining uh, the member states of the so-called Anglosphere uh, the way that political right would like them to be defined, or uh, they could be defined uh, in, a, in a different way, the sort of way that Paul Keating and the first Kevin Rudd government uh, would like them to be defined, which is perhaps more progressive, more open uh, to the idea of uh, entering uh, the region of Asia Pacific, which is now being redefined, of course, as the Indo-Pacific, uh, while uh, putting down the, the or minimizing the role of former colonial powers uh, in, EU, in Australian foreign policy. All right, I have uh, another two questions which I bring together. So I, then we have more time for, for the discussion. The first one is um, actually linking up to, I didn't think about Huntington, um, but uh, the Qin Yanxing, the Chinese scholar, uh, has written a book on the relational theory of world politics in which he perceives um, Chinese understandings of, in, of, of pol political affairs, but therefore also international affairs, basically in terms of a scaled up family relations as well. So you feel in closer relational circles, uh, you feel more confident. Um, and the idea is to have international affairs as a kind of enlarging these kind of friendship circles uh, as they are. Um, but he makes also a remark that um, this has been seen by the English school that it is much easier to be together with people whom you share common values, which would in your language be the Anglosphere. Now, if that is taken seriously, then of course the Chinese uh, could criticize very much uh, the idea of white supremacy, seeing itself as a victim and therefore entitled to defend, but could also be invited to perfectly do the exact same and saying that, hey, here we go, we have shared values. Uh, there's an Asian environment, confusion, or whatever you call, call, call it, and therefore we are entitled indeed to make our um, collaborations in a, uh, how can I say, wider family. Uh, and then uh, and thereby contradicting to some extent the security interests uh, of the very West, which is in there. So the um, first question I had is whether there is any attempt to counter um, the potentially negative uh, diplomatic um, uh, externalities of, of this treaty. And added to this, I add uh, the second question because it's closely related. Um, when we are discussing NATO enlargement and the recent discussions about uh, the war in Ukraine, very often we forget that uh, um, there has been a lot changing ever, ever after 1990, namely that the entire uh, European security architecture, the arms control architecture, has been taken away. So we had the ABM treaty, which was stopped by Bush Jr. We had uh, the um, the verification protocol of the biological treaty, which was not uh, signed again by Bush Jr., the agreement for conventional forces in Europe, the treaty for conventional forces in Europe was uh, given up, and Trump finally got rid of the Intermediate Nuclear Force Treaty and the Open Sky uh, one is also in which they got out. So basically, we got rid of the entire security architecture, which embedded uh, the alliances and so on. Uh, and that has happened. So there was a huge shift actually happening ever since the 90s, and only that nobody was really taking it so seriously. Now, my question for the uh, for the environment, the security environment, is then, of course, how does the AUKUS embed itself in the security architecture with ASEAN, with whatever else you want to look at, uh, and how can it avoid to be just a military answer when uh, on the long run a political solution or a political agreement needs to be made in order to keep uh, that part of the world not repeating all the mistakes that the Europeans have been through. More great questions. Uh, thanks. Uh, so on the question of has there been attempts uh, to any attempts to, I guess, heal the rift, not in Europe or not vis-a-vis -vis the West, but with China. Uh, well, yes and no. I, I think, I think as you yourself 
have argued, you know, these security communities uh, work on, on a variety of levels. I mean, it's not just state to state relations, but of course, you know, society to society as well. Uh, I, I mean, I would say that, you know, what happened vis-a-vis -vis France and the EU uh, is very much the difference with what's happening with China right now. Australia, I think under this government, what's trying to demonstrate is that, you know, you can be sanctioned by China or completely kind of cut off uh, from China economically and otherwise uh, and, and still succeed uh, or rather suffer limited, limited consequences. Uh, yeah, I think it's safe to say that Australia's relations with China have not been this bad for generations. Uh, and I think these types of decisions have uh, ramifications. I mean, it's, it's, it's obviously they have their own logic. Uh, I, 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 I'm not, I mean, I can see a future government in Canberra will make different choices that will perhaps uh, create possibilities for dialogue and negotiation as opposed to uh, deterrence or claims to deterrence and conflict. Uh, what's perhaps more interesting is is Beijing, right? Because it takes two to tangle. And I'm seeing not too many attempts to change what's been uh, a very aggressive turn in Chinese diplomacy. It usually goes under the term wolf warrior, uh, which is coming from Chinese popular culture and, and it's sort of become a global rubric. Uh, but there's a, a certain continuity there. Uh, Chinese interest in talking about Western racism or Western hypocrisy predates the People's Republic. Uh, Sun Yat-sen, the putative father of modern China, so a person who celebrated equally on both sides of the Taiwan Straits, uh, was the one who you know, lectured about the white man's imperialistic uh, behavior and the need of the so-called wrong races to come together and fight for man mankind's uh, injustice. Uh, decades later, uh, Mao's foreign minister, uh, Zhou Enlai, would articulate the same message while touring Africa, the so-called Enlai's uh, African safaris. And then China tried uh, to do this uh, uh, with uh, a variety, well, with the Bandung Conference in 1955. All of those attempts failed, you know, to basically recast the Cold War into some kind of a, you know, a race war or anti-racist war. There was perhaps an anti-colonial component to Chinese communist discourse during the Cold War, but now that seems to be gone. Now, now it's just, you know, simple trolling, as we call it, attempts to uh, fawn the flames of culture wars in places like Canada, Australia by, uh, you know, through, through diplomacy, Chinese ambassadors, um, um, participate in this as as uh, as vigorously as uh, Chinese English language media, and and yeah, I worry. I think uh, I I think you know I I see I see Australia changing something, uh, but uh, I I don't see much change under the current regime in in Beijing. And uh, you yes, you mentioned Tianjia. I haven't read that particular book, but I've read some other books on relationality of Tianjia in Chinese kind of IR theory. And how this opens up the possibility for so-called dialogue of civilizations, in which you know you wouldn't have necessarily uh, these kinds of conflict, conflictual processes and outcomes, and that's that's possible. And I think we would all prefer to see that, but you know, well, it it just doesn't <laughs> not in the near term. It seems uh, things might get worse before before they get better. Uh, with respect to uh, your second question about. Um, the arms control uh, and the security act architecture in Europe and what AUKUS uh, plays, uh, what sort of role AUKUS plays in that. Uh, well, uh, it's, uh, you know, you, we've all heard of uh, the, the, the term global NATO. I mean, this was popular in the 2000s. And, 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 you know, a lot of thinkers in various Washington DC think tanks, but not just there, elsewhere as well, were dreaming up a possibility of expanding uh, uh, NATO uh, in one way or another uh, globally, such that we would have uh, a military arm of what Victorians would call, you know, Union of Democracies or something like that. Now, I also see that <laughs> this is strengthening as well. Um, you know, no, no one's necessarily saying, "Oh, let's have the Anglosphere politically," but a few people are saying, "Well, you know, this idea of a summit for democracy." used to be Summit of Democracies, then became Summit for Democracy, is a good one. And we should have the, you know, D7, D8, D10, this is another UK foreign policy idea, 
uh, gain a formalization of sorts, institutionally speaking, such that we have a concept of democracies that can deal with various miscreants, uh, militarily, politically, socially, if you like. Uh, and and uh, AUKUS will enter, I think, that sort of conversation. I mean, first of all, we don't know what's going to happen with the technological and arms uh, transfer deals with AUKUS. That's, that's a whole other back. But politically, it's probably here to stay. And what we're going to see is some sort of attempt to create uh, architecture that brings in AUKUS uh, with France, with you know, Asian democracies in some kind of AUKUS plus framework. Uh, there's, of course, the Quad. There's uh, a, a variety. So uh, Asia, Asia Pacific infrastructure has a variety of fora uh, which can be brought into a closer di dialogue with, with this new pact. Um, with respect uh, to the rest of the five eyes, so this is very interesting. New Zealand already put out a statement saying, well, we're not going to allow these future nuclear powered Australian submarines in our territorial waters, uh, which is very interesting. We're talking about 2040. Who knows who's going to be in power in both Canberra and, uh, and, and, and Wellington at the time. Uh, but Canada, my country, surprised me very much. I, I was following the reactions of our elite leaders at the time. And uh, even the NDP leader, Jagmeet Singh, and this is the New Democratic Party, quasi-socialist party, a formerly socialist party in Canada. So this is terrible. How is it that we're not part of AUKUS? Canada, we don't, we don't even think about some of, this, some of these issues uh, in ways that Australians do. But there was a sense that there was a FOMA, fear of missing out. Why aren't we in this pact, uh, given that we are all, all part of the five eyes and so on? So there will be, I think, uh, pressure to expand AUKUS, perhaps not by putting C in front of AUKUS, calling it caucus or whatever. But there will be a pressure to expand it in, in some way, uh, institutionally, such that it doesn't look like a three-eyed pact, but rather it's, 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 let's say, one of the pillars of the future, either Asia Pacific or uh, global security uh, architecture. Uh, I'm not sure if this can be done, but I can, I can see, I can see the, the, the political dynamic behind it, propelling it forward. Thank you, John. Um, th that's enough for me. Thanks very much. I, I pass on to Vivek. Okay, thank you. Yes, yeah, and I can see we have a few questions in the Q and A, but I'll just, I'll just basically, I think, ask you one question, Satyan, um, or or maybe two related questions that both have to do with, um, that both have to do with sort of the new national conservative right in Europe and the U.S. and AUKUS. And in a sense, they just speak to some of the culture wars between a continental France-driven continent uh, and the Anglo-American or UK-US uh, alliance. Um, but I want the rift, the potential rift there, I just want to ask you to expand a bit further on that. Because, I mean, I, as you, as you know, I've been involved in the past couple of years in a, in a project that deals with uh, sort of the new right in, in, in Europe, and, and in the US. Um, and it surprised me in a sense to see how much of the European new right um, in France, in Germany, in Central Eastern Europe, that is driven very much by sort of older geopolitical antipathies against the Anglo-American world. This notion is all the way back for some of, for some of them and a reactivation of old imaginaries of land powers and sea powers and these this notion that you have um, that you have a, a u.s and a, an anglo-american world that just cares about trade and that mm -hmm. basically thinks of culture as profit that mm -hmm. it's basically just about the support of economic globalism mm -hmm. and that sort of national conservative right has has gained ground in in, in europe on in continental europe it has, in a rather explicit and radical ways, dreamed of expelling the U.S. from, con from sort of from continental Europe. It's glad if the U.S. wants to join AUKUS and spend less time on NATO. It doesn't like the American imposed order in its conceptualizations of things that appeared after World War II. So I was just wondering, and I mean, I think one place where you see that is the um, 
would be some of the, the past French elections. I know my, my colleague, many Kumi here at least, has, uh, has taken an interest in that. How, how much of the new America or the new French right is driven by antipathy to the US and Britain also, in the sense that it's an antipathy to thinking about liberalism or European culture and the European cultural heritage as being about trade and something that can be, you know, that can be globally, you, that you can be a missionary of globally. No, it's a European thing and it has to stay here and it can only be a European thing. Anyway, I wanted to ask you if you think that that sort of the rise of a very continental centered national right in, in Europe may somehow feed into this. So it's not just about the US and Britain wanting to leave Europe or continental Europe, it's also that continental Europe beyond just France doesn't want them here anymore because it doesn't think that much in terms of economic globalism anymore. It's concerned with other issues. And Central Eastern Europe is certainly part of, of, of that development. So that's one question. And, and it, it just led me to a question about, um, I mean, when we, um, about the American rights and office, because when you think about or, or when you accuse office, when people accuse office of being, you know, institutionalized white supremacy, you think, oh, the American right must love it. Um, but actually part of the, you know, the far right in, in, in the US these days would very much be aligned with continental Europe in, in this notion that um, our culture cannot really be um, exported and we should return home and cultivate what's ours here. And this is a liberal dream in many ways, and it's driven with, by obsessions with trade and notions of, of, of global uh, economic globalism that we don't care for. So, so if you could give, give us a sense maybe just of where you see, I mean, where you see the real support for office in the American context, um, mm. uh, that would, I think that would be uh, helpful. And after that, I think we should go to the Q and A. Uh, I saw the questions there; they're quite long, some of them. Oh, okay, okay. So maybe I shouldn't just read them aloud. Maybe you need to read them too. Okay, okay. I haven't seen the questions yet. Uh, I'll try to answer yours first, and then and then we'll go through the. I, uh, thank you, uh, thank you both again for for doing this. Uh, it's yeah, I'm enjoying questions tremendously. Uh, so, yeah, about liberalism, that does AUKUS stand for liberalism? In the Anglosphere, yes, of course, they, they claim they do, right? Uh, but what kind of liberalism is it? Uh, you see a backlash against it in the U.S., uh, in U.S. politics, for sure. Uh, from 2021, I think it was March, there was an extremely bizarre uh, example of the so-called America First Caucus. This was a group of pro-Trump representatives who tried to create in Congress uh, uh, some sort of a platform uh, which defines America, and, and I'm trying to remember it, a nation with a border, a culture strengthened by a common respect for uniquely Anglo-Saxon political tradition. So basically they're saying exactly what China is saying. You know, we are an Anglo-Saxon country with Anglo-Saxon allies. We want a certain kind of trade, not with South America or Asia. We actually are happy to trade with our Anglo-Saxon brethren, uh, including perhaps you know Europeans who whose goods and services uh, we can stomach, uh, but you know this was in harmonizing with recent development at the state level in the U.S., where you have countless new pieces of legislations that are being mobilized towards uh, restricting all kinds of rights, uh, stifling law enforcement reforms, muffling expression, uh, you know women's rights, especially curbing what. GOP leaders and supporters call excesses of liberalism or liberal managerialism. Now, in the Europe, in the European context, you see something very, very similar. I mean, you hear, you see uh, the rising tide of the right, uh, which is reviving some of the old anti-American discourses. We have books, you know, on this. I mean, I'm thinking Cohen and Katzenstein have this book on anti-Americanisms with a some kind of a two by two or two two by three matrix that you know shows well there's different kinds of anti-Americanisms there's the left wings right wing and so on. Brendan O'Connor, my friend and co-author, I mentioned earlier, he has a four volume, uh, I think, book on anti-Americanism and so the, all of these things are already there. Andrew Markovitz, I forgot, University of Michigan, uh, another seminal work on anti-Americanism. All of these discourses are there. They can be easily grafted into 
culture wars of okay. today. Now, what I find interesting uh, is, you know, how uh, various actors are seeing this as an opportunity, not as a crisis, but as an opportunity. So uh, I mentioned earlier this op-ed from Global Times, uh, so-called you know, China's angriest English language tabloid. And the Financial Times responded to it. So Wall Street Journal responded to it. Financial Times responded to it. Wall Street argued that, oh, you know, you know, China is doing what uh, the Stalin and Pravda was doing during the Cold War, right? They're just, you know, trying to make America weaker by, uh, uh, you know, in putting a megaphone on, on on its divisions. But at that time, it mattered. Civil rights movement was act, an actual thing that made made America stronger. Now we have this empty woke ideology that's just making things worse. Uh, and it's the fault of the left, right? Uh, you know, Global Times editors are crude, but they've been reading the New York Times, and that's dangerous. This is Wall Street Journal. Financial Times says, okay, we have to take this seriously. Why? Uh, we have to uh, understand that our anti-racist liberalism is a val valuable foreign policy strategy. Uh, if the United States and its allies are recognized as champions of racial equality, then we will win the international battle for hearts and, and, and minds or heart and soul with China, because you want to contrast multicultural United States with the ethnocentric China. Yeah, we did this arguably during the Cold War uh, with our opponents. We can do it uh, again today. Uh, and this is in the same uh, column uh, in the Financial Times, uh, uh, the, the author says, but we have to worry about France and the French because they hate our identity politics. So we can't be, we, we can't be too, too upfront about anti-racist liberalism. We have to kind of package it nicely so that Macron wouldn't be upset. I mean, it's, it's, it's really remarkable. This is ge cultural geopolitics happening in the pages of you know, most read newspapers in the world, you know, Financial Times, formerly known as the newspaper of globalization. Um, and, and you can see how this translates in diplomatic discourse. Uh, so you know, when China accuses uh, whatever, Canada, Australia, all, all five of them of white supremacy, uh, diplomats in the United Nations react very strongly to it. Canadian diplomat would say, yeah, true, you know, we, we you know, horrible things happened in Canada. We're, we're, we're going through reconciliation right now. But where are Chinese truth and reconciliation commissions? Are you doing anything, right, uh, to, to talk about your own past and present? And then U.S. Ambassador uh, Linda Thomas-Greenfield, she said, uh, yeah, we, I, I'm, I'm African-American, you know, white supremacy is weaved into the world, but you know we have work to do. And this is a global thing. We have flaws, deep, serious flaws. We're doing something about that. We're working to address that. Now, this feeds into culture wars immediately, right? As soon as people, you know, on the right here, someone like Linda Thomas Greenfield in the UN saying, "Yeah, we are white supremacists," they go nuts, right? How dare you destroy the Western civilization by admitting to Chinese talking points in the first place? Uh, and I think this is. This is the kind of big question for liberals, right? What what sort of answer do you have uh, in this fight? Are you actually going to agree with those who say that Western civilization is being undermined by merely admitting that you know at some point in history uh, and and you know in some elements of the present there are huge problems that need to be resolved, these deep flaws, or or do you say, well, actually the the right has a point. Uh, you know, we can't we can't let our guard down. Uh, I, I, once again, like I said er, in an earlier response to Stefano, we, we don't we don't we don't know what what the dominant response the response will be. And I'm speaking from Canada, which is supposedly avoiding all these uh, you know big uh, you know European and uh, U.S. style political moments where you have rising right. It's unclear here as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, then, then we have questions in the Q&A. Can you oh. see them too, um, Stefano? <laughs> or uh, can you see them too, Sajan? Yes, I see. Starting with Professor Hans Moritzen, whose work I have also uh, learned from and used to teach classes. This is great. So the first one is, in spite of newfound Western cohesion in relation to Ukraine, uh, the UK is more hawkish than the French on the Germans. Uh, can this be traced to your angles, your concept? Yes. Uh, or is it more to ad hoc reasons? Well, it's a bit of both. It's a bit of contingencies and, and kind of structural ideologies. I think there is much to be said 
uh, about uh, the UK being more hawkish. I mean, that's in line with uh, an ideology that says we're still a great power, right? We we might have what seventy eight commissioned ships, of which you know a few of them will be in the Indo Pacific, supporting uh, the French and the Germans, and of course the Americans in their Indo Pacific stra strategy. Um, but above, above all, you know, we're there to fight for freedom and democracy, uh, and I, I think that is very resonant uh, with other elites as well as with. Uh, the masses uh, in the UK. Um, I think it obviously has to do with diver diversionary issues as well. I mean, but I, I really don't think a different prime minister uh, in you know Downing Street 10 would, would do anything different uh, in this case. They would still be the first to ship weapons to Ukraine. They would be still the first to say, okay, you know, billions of dollars are going to our Ukrainian allies and so on. Um, it's This is an interesting question for the NATO area, because you clearly have two types of responses. Uh, so you have on 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 the one hand, uh, people like Macron and Merkel slash Scholz, who are you know obviously preferring uh, to enter in some sort of negotiations with uh, opponents of the EU. I, I I maybe I'm putting words in their mouths. I mean, Macron's speech uh, yesterday was was very clear. You know, he's saying the quiet part loud. Uh, you know, there's not going to be a European enlargement. What you can get is some sort of, uh, you know, political community, but that's obviously contingent on future uh, political conversations about who belongs and who doesn't belong. And then on the other hand, you have northern states, you know, Sweden, Finland, if you like, uh, Denmark, uh, probably, uh, with Eastern European states, you know, Baltics, Poland, uh, who, for whom, you know, this war is an existential question. Uh, and, uh, what, you know, they want exactly the kind of support that they're getting from the UK and the US uh, in um, responding uh, to these, uh, to the threat posed by Putin's Russia. Uh, and, and I think that's a much bigger debate. I mean, who, which version of Europe will win in the end? Uh, and if is this even Europe or is this, you know, if you're on the left, you'd call it, you know, some sort of, you know, which version of militarism is, is going to prevail? Uh, I, I, I don't I don't have a I don't have a good answer apart from saying that, yeah, it's a little bit of both. Uh, sorry, Professor Mortensen. <laughs> uh, OK, so second question. Uh, uh, so. Uh, sorry, it's going to take me there. It's a long one. Uh, so, so is Australia basically trying to make itself def uh, defendable and also as economically dependent on the PRC? This is coming from uh, Rafael Moreto. Uh, what uh, was at some point a major European concern rather than the RIF we've seen today? Yes, that's true. Um, okay, so yeah, there are lots here, uh, lots of really great points. Um, I mean, what do we do with uh, you know, who, who, who's, who in the United States is uh, happy about AUKUS? Well, I earlier said, uh, you know, it's very interesting how different political actors are using these types of political moments as an opportunity, not just a crisis. Uh, there's obviously people in the Pentagon and around Pentagon, the so-called military industrial complex that, that's very happy with these kinds of deals. Uh, I focused on Australia earlier because Australia has the greatest uh, strategic, political, and financial risks with AUKUS. Uh, the winner is probably the UK because it's uh, in its interest, in the interest of its defense industrial base to have these types of uh, technology transfers and arms deals transfers. Um, what does this mean for, uh, for you know, in terms of European uh, risk, you know, strategy? Uh, well, uh, I think the initial reaction by people like uh, Macron uh, in, in France was the correct one. Uh, the more you do your Anglosphere things, the more we're going to be uh, calling for strategic autonomy. Now, well, that's easier said than done, obviously. Uh, strategic autonomy, above all, as uh, Raphael mentioned in the, in, the, in the question, means weaning itself off from Russian energy, uh, oil and gas. Uh, and uh, what I'm seeing so far, and uh, you, obviously you're much closer to this debate than, than I am, is that there is a great deal of uh, your you know, Western unity on this. There is uh, a mechanism in place that will produce some sort of containment policy of some kind, we don't call it containment, of Russia. 
uh, in the near term. How long that's going to stick uh, is, I think, an open question. Uh, as for the fact that there are militias in Ukraine that are associated with uh, uh, you know, illegal actors as well as the, the far right, well, that's simply the nature of any war. I, I think when you know, we in Canada or you in Denmark are sending weapons uh, to Ukraine, you, you, you don't know where they're going to end up. I mean, some of them will surely end up on the so-called black arms market and then you know, we'll see them popping up places that we didn't think <laughs> we, we, we didn't think we'd see them. Uh, that's just the, the nature of, of arms transfers. And, you know, in, in situations like this, countries like Denmark, the Netherlands, Sweden, Norway, they, they, you know, they're all signatories of the arms trade treaty. Uh, and they have restrictions on what, what types of weapons can be exported to what types of recipients. Uh, these these restrictions are restricted uh, themselves in these situations, and yeah, I mean it's it's just a more simple moral calculation. Yeah, we know that this is you know causing problems down the line, but the point is to help uh, Ukrainians, and I I'm I'm on board with that agreement. I mean we have to express uh, solidarity with people who are losing their lives, uh, livelihoods, lifelines in, in every way, and that does not mean that we should not worry about you know people in Yemen or Syria, or even Russians who are sabotaging Putin's effort. I, I think the opposite. Set, and we're actually on time now, but I can see that the two remaining, or at least there were two questions that slightly oh. left. So for those who have time, maybe one to hang on, maybe one final answer. Both, both of the questions I can see sort of relate to France. There's one that concerns how you mentioned France uh, perceived AUKUS as a step in the back, but are there any differences in how the various AUKUS countries look at France and how do you see their relationships evolving in the near future, which sort of, I suppose, could be seen as overlapping with the other question that asks um, what are possible ways for intent and collaboration over France and by okay. oh, this. This is great. This is a question coming from my good friend Falk Osterman, uh, professor at uh, Kiel, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so it's good to see you here. Well, see see your question here rather. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, yeah the the French the French angle. It, it's something that I wish I had more time to spend on because I think it's a really interesting one. Uh, if you ask me, uh, yeah, France is very important because various reasons, well, one of which was it was the first European country to come up with an Indo-Pacific strategy, right? Uh, and uh, you know, one reason for this is the actual presence of the French state and society in the Indo-Pacific, unlike you could argue the UK, which has less of a stake, uh, but more perhaps of a symbolic stake. Um, I mean, I personally, I mean, I, I, if I was some kind of you know planner in the Western Alliance uh, that that seems uh, poised to take on the rising China, I, I would be advocating for a division of labor, right? Uh, what well, you know, Europeans should focus on on Europe and let let, let Americans and its allies in, in the Asia uh, Pacific uh, deal uh, with uh, with that region and specifically uh, rising China. Uh, yes, uh, I think. That, that would be the, the kind of rational thing to do. Uh, these uh, strategies are important for reasons other than security. Obviously, Asia Pacific is where most people live and you know, all the kind of uh, you know, future uh, climate change induced uh, crisis such as COVID-19 are going to originate in this region. So you, st you have to have a strategy. I've been an advocate of you know, Canada producing an actual strategy on anything uh, of which Indo-Pacific would be a part. Uh, but uh, yeah, I don't. I don't actually think that you know uh, European countries should overcommit to this region as opposed to focus on what they're doing right now, which is uh, protecting themselves from uh, from the eastern flank. Um, and yeah, I mean, if we go back to the Cold War uh, era, I mean, France has been at loggerheads with you know New Zealand. It's been kind of upset that it was not uh, privy to some of the earlier versions of AUKUS and so on, uh, but every, you know, it, it's, it's much easier to reconstitute uh, some kind of security ties with a country like France than uh, with your Asian partners, not least those who are kind of outside by definition. Uh, 
Um, so I don't, I don't think France will be forever kept out. Uh, it's, it's simply impossible. 1.6 Frenchmen who live there, French women who live there, speak against it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we're over time, but um, if we are to finish on that French note, I think perhaps um, it would be interesting, or it, an interesting observation is that there will be many questions regarding France, I think, in the future, because if you experience what we're going through right now, from a Western European perspective, you do feel that the European Union, which here in Denmark, by the way, we're having a vote on right now whether to fully commit to in terms of our security policies. So this sense that the European Union is basically our local or regional security institution. And Britain left. The German strategy has just been de delegitimized in some ways. That was sort of the I mean, right now, Germany is not who people look to because it seems so delegitimized in terms of its trade as a security strategy vis-a-vis -vis Russia. And every that may pass, but that's the sentiment right now. So just this moment, I think a lot of Western Europeans feel, but does that mean that France is basically our voice and negotiator in a global security landscape that, where new sort of architectures are forming? So I think that it's not not a coincidence that there are a lot of, of, of questions there because can France then get along with the Anglo-Saxons or right? Yeah, that's and, what I, and I see a question from Money Trone. Apologies, I didn't see it right away, but that, that just speaks to exactly what you're saying, Vivek. Yeah, it does. Yeah, and, and just thank you so much, that and um, that was that was great um, and uh, surprising to many of us, I think, to see how much. Um, found how how many other structures are already in place before office became a reality. Hope we will um, be seeing you on Zoom soon again. Um, thank you and thank you to the audience for staying tuned a little over time. Thanks. Thank you.